So you've mentioned the word metabolic a few times. And if you go to metabolicneurologist.com, you'll find your website. Yeah. So you, you go by the title of a metabolic neurologist. I hadn't heard of a metabolic neurologist until I've met you. Why, why, what is a metabolic neurologist and how did you come to think of yourself as one of those? Well, to my knowledge, prior to me adopting the title, metabolic neurology didn't really exist. I mean, people study it in some way, shape, or form, but to t come out and say, here's a new subfield of metabolic neurology, and I'm a metabolic neurologist, I think, I think I'm still the only person really doing that. And, you know, part of it's a, you know, what you think you become kind of thing. So I'm trying to propel this concept, but I do think metabolic neurology will be a, a field of importance in the future. What is a metabolic neurologist? It is a person who, first of all, uh, conceptualizes that most of the lifestyle-related disorders, uh, many of which are in neurology, for example, uh, Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disorders would be a good example, uh, have a underlying metabolic basis. And metabolism just is a word that describes all the chemical and biochemical reactions in your body and all your cells and in your mitochondria, which are the batteries of the cells. And a metabolic neurologist realizes that maybe mitochondria dysfunction is the problem, the core issue with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other neurodegenerative disorders, and maybe brain, you know, forms of brain cancer and so on. And therefore, if that is so, then the best way to address these disorders is to use some medications to help people feel better, but recognize as a metabolic neurologist that medications don't actually slow down or reverse these disorders at all. And we want to also use therapies that maybe can do that, which changes the whole thing from medications being the main game to suddenly these metabolic therapies or metabolic strategies, what I call them, to being the main game. And metabolic strategies, which I'm sure we'll get into, involve things like um, proper fasting protocols, ketogenic diets, and specialized forms of exercise and so on. Okay, so I guess the, you, the, the other thing that came up there a bit, which... I suppose we need to explore is this idea of the mitochondria as you talked about them as the batteries or the energy suppliers of the, of, of cellular metabolism and well, all cells in the, every cell in the body has got mitochondria, right? They, uh, and so you've got a special understanding and interest in, in how that works and how things might go, not how they should in that, in that particular part of the, of each cell. Yeah, that's right. So, um, if you look at these disorders, uh, you know, cancer, dis uh, cancer anywhere, but cancers of the brain, such as glioblastoma multiform, and also the neurodegenerative disorders, uh, the most common is Alzheimer's disease, followed by things like Parkinson's, frontotemporal dementia, and so on. Mitochondrial dysfunction is a very strong element underpinning all of it in both disorders. It's just that in the neurodegenerative disorders, the mitochondrial dysfunction is in the neurons, whereas in uh, cancer, say, even cancers of the brain, virtually always the mitochondrial dysfunction is not in the neurons, but in these support cells around the neurons called glial cells, which are really important. And there's about as many of them as there are neurons in the brain. So uh, the mitochondrial dysfunction takes many forms. They look very odd. So they look, uh, their shapes are messed up. They're supposed to be nice and ellipsoid. And in cancer, for example, in, in our Alzheimer's, they're too round or too long, too skinny. They're also supposed to join up fusion and split apart fission routinely in a healthy mitochondria population. And they don't do that very well in either of these disorders. And there's other things. Mitochondria are supposed to... Um, be able to do things like uh, couple and uncouple their energy production from heat production. So if they, um, this is a bit of a funny concept to understand, but if they, if they're properly, um, if they can uncouple properly, then they uh, are able to get rid of a lot of free radical energy in the form of heat and so on. Whereas, uh, you know, I think it's that ability to couple and uncouple is very important, and that's probably messed up in these disorders too. There's many other ways they're messed up. Uh, they, Mitogenesis is screwed up, so mitochondria constantly renew themselves, and this does not occur very well in these disorders. And mitophagy is another thing on the other end of the spectrum of their life, where you know you mitochondria are supposed to sort of um, get rid of the old junky ones periodically, so that new ones can come 
come on board and that is messed up too. So there's a whole range of mitochondria problems in cancer and cancers of the brain and Alzheimer's. You talked about two things. I just want to explore a little bit more this idea of fusion and fission. So normal mitochondria will sometimes join together. What's going on there? Sometimes split apart. Why are they doing that? Okay. Yeah. So uh, first of all, there are hundreds, if not thousands of mitochondria per cell in most cells of the body. Neurons are particularly packed with them because they rely a lot on mitochondria and uh, they don't have a lot of the enzymes for glycolysis, which is another energy pathway, as you know, Grant. What uh, we think happens when mitochondria come together and fuse is um, they just basically, it's that they, you have, a, say, two mitochondria, they come together and they join up. And through this process, perhaps uh, the more damaged mitochondria, you know, the damage can be reduced or mitigated by uh, adopting characteristics of the healthier one. And with uh, fission, which is mitochondria splitting, so, you know, uh, neurons have little small spaces and terminals and things, and sometimes big mitochondria might not be able to get in there. Fission is important because it allows them to get smaller and move into these spaces and get the energy within the neuron where it needs to be. And remember neurons, some of these neurons are up to a meter long. They're very, very long. And so mitochondria need to move all around the neuron at all times in order to get the energy where it needs to be. Yeah, that's just an amazing sort of, uh, it's just, I, I am always amazed when we start to think about how the body works and how biology has got to this point of uh, evolving. Uh, there's also an idea that, that, that mitochondria have different, mitochondrial DNA is different. Is that, is that a thing? From, nu from nuclear DNA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess my, <laughs> from the, how, how I they think even you're right. There? Um, yeah. Okay, so from the standpoint, okay, so the idea is um, that mitochondria were originally a very uh, ancient form of bacteria that um, sort of developed this uh symbiotic uh, symbiotic relationship with these cells and now they provide the energy for the cells and the cells give them a nice stable home and uh i guess from a mitochondria dysfunction standpoint um they would have therefore two different uh genomes uh sets of dna one within the mitochondria that they used to use and then one for the cell and now uh you know a lot of the uh there's a lot of mixing up uh, together. So a lot of the, the sort of cell genome, uh, the genes make things for the mitochondria and vice versa. From a mitochondria dysfunction standpoint, the most uh, important part of this to me is that probably the repair systems for the nuclear genome, the nuclear DNA are better, more efficient than the ones for the mitochondria. And so damage can potentially accrue or build up in the mitochondria DNA um, genome more easily. And, and this could lead to mitochondria dysfunction more selectively within the cell rather than uh, you know, the cell itself getting damaged. But if a mitochondria-centric theory is correct, that's a, uh, where mitochondria are the aspect of health that's most important, which is what I believe, then uh, that's a problem. You need to uh, really take extra care of your mitochondria. And I should also say, <clears throat> although mitochondria are often seen as the batteries of cells, from a mitochondria-centric perspective, and this is the way I see it now, mitochondria is what we are made of primarily, not cells. Cells are just houses for mitochondria. <laughs> I love it. That's okay, an important mind shift. That's an important, yeah, 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 it's an important yeah, yeah, mind that is a, shift. That, yeah, is a, that, yeah. is a, that is a very... Um, Big mind shift, isn't it? Because we think of cells, every cell in the body, every cell it in the body, okay, so it is housing these super important energy producing thing. Okay, so so go, go going back there. There's a sort of idea back in the in the days of the primordial soup. We've got these uh, single cell amoebae type organisms that, that they've somehow taken on board bacteria that are able to act in a way that actually makes them more uh, more more of a functioning cell, and those evolve preferentially, and away we go from there. <laughs> 